Welcome everybody to the Tea with Miss McGill show fueled by our friends over at Blue Line Brews. We are not in the beautiful Blue Line Brew Studios. As you can see, we are at the Ring Sports Bar and Grill in Eveleth, uh, kind enough to play us, play host to us tonight. So Blue Line Brews, you kind of know the drill. Uh, BlueLineBrews.com, save 15, the promo code. 10% of profits go back to uh, officers, uh, families of officers that have been injured in the line of duty or have fallen in the line of duty. So great coffee, uh, great cause. K-Cups are available. Uh, also in store, so pay attention to the logo here. Take a look at that. In stores, Bemidji, Iron Range, Twin Ports, Northern Wisconsin, you can find uh, the product on the shelf. And of course, if you uh, want to support the men and women in blue, which I know you do, uh, go ahead and go to their social pages, Blue Line Brews, and uh, give them a like and follow them. That would be great. We'd appreciate that greatly. All right. So summer format, we're doing our, our monthly uh, interview format. So we have got, of course, the star of the show, Reed Larson. I am Puka. Special guest today, Brian Perpich, uh, referee extraordinaire. So we're gonna yeah. we're gonna have some fun and uh, talk a little about some refereeing and just uh, some of the different angles and and kind of how Perp got started and everything. So welcome, Perp. Good to have <laughs> you here, man. Good to have you. Thanks, guys. Welcome to the Tea with Miss McGill show. So go ahead and read fire away. Well, before we even start with questions, I just uh, you mentioned we're here at the Rink Bar and Grill in Eveleth, and I just wanted to show you kind of just what it looks like here in one little corner. Okay, they've got jerseys all over the building in here um, and little locker room stalls. So as you can see, I'm sitting underneath the Virginia Blue Devil stall, which is no longer, no longer the Virginia Blue Devils. They are the Rock Ridge Wolverines. You got International Falls and you got Babbitt right there, but there are some different Iron Range schools all around the building. Yeah. And I thought that was pretty cool that we're sitting here uh, in this area and for whatever reason it worked out and i said well you know what i'll send her the virginia one here so yeah we got yeah um, there's a gilbert buccaneers jersey yes. over there, Chisholm's over there so yeah well and there was a grand rapids over one over there too but i didn't notice that a little one. busy over there and it was right next it. to hibbing i saw i, didn't I saw greenway i saw Hibbing. I yeah it's known so i did well I, I, but you know what next best for me yeah. is my old blue devils here no longer they no longer exist but so burp uh you know i thought this was a great idea by roger uh, by poop to bring this thing in and uh, start talking about uh, uh, some referee things. I think it's important for our, our viewers to, uh, during the season, we, we talk a lot about the competition. We talk a lot about high school hockey, um, even college and pro hockey at times. Uh, but I think it's important for us as people to understand that there's, there's no game of hockey. We can't have a game unless we have the guys wearing the black and white stripes out there. That's a huge, important piece to our game. Uh, it's a huge respect factor that needs to go out there for the people. And I, we really appreciate you being here uh, to be able to talk on behalf of the referees. So thanks for being here. No problem. So I, I guess just some questions I think um, that are important for us to hear is, first of all, uh, your passion for refing. You've been doing it as long as I've been coaching in the area and longer. Uh, why do you do it and why do you yeah. still continue? To <laughs> I don't know. That's what I was in my first was like, I, we never talked about this. I'm like, what turned you on to refing? Well, what, what turned me on actually, you know, I, I was, let's see, I was probably 11, 12 years old and uh, I was a squirt at the time and someone asked, does anybody want to ref? And there was five mini mite games or white mite games back then. And um, I said, well, yeah, uh, what did they pay? And, and they were hour long games and there was five bucks a game. And I thought, well, heck, that's as much money as I make in my paper out in a month. <laughs> so, um, you know, and that was back in, uh, in, the, in the 1986 range. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I found it fascinating that I could make, uh, you know, $25 as much as a month in five hours in which uh, on a Saturday afternoon, in which I wasn't doing anything. So originally it was, you know, wow, I can make some money here. But as, as time went on and as I started uh, progressing throughout the levels and, 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 you know, I just really, well, first of all, I was continuing as a player. Um, and then, and then my senior year, uh, we had a couple of Chisholm guys that came over. I'm not going to mention any names, but they took our spots on the varsity team. <laughs> and, you know, I was left with, a, 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 I was left with an opportunity. Um, you know, people can say that, well, you know, you're not meant to, and they just happened to make it to the state tournament that year. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah. I was, I was figured, you know, I, uh, actually at that point, um, it was still one of my dreams, as it is any young 
young hockey player growing up is to uh, skate on that state tournament ice. And at that point, because uh, I, I have a twin brother, uh, Scott Furpich, who played on the 94 uh, Blue Jacket team that went to state, um, I was, I was, I'm not going to lie, I was, I was a little bit jealous, but I told myself one way or another, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to make my dream come true. And that's when I really decided to, to step for, step forth in my career and, and really, uh, that's what drove me to the passion. And, you know, um, and then it just became a part of my life and, you know, to, to, to not have refing, uh, it w- it would be like, I, I, first of all, I feel like I'm giving back to the game. I don't really sure. do it. I don't really do it for the money. However, if, it, if, if they weren't going to pay me, I wouldn't do it. But, <laughs> yeah, but right, I, right. I mean, I don't, make, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't make, I don't make, you know, I don't, it's not like I'm getting, you know, a thousand dollars a game, but um, uh, the real reason is because it, it keeps me in shape, it, 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 relatively good shape. Um, I have to, you know, as they say in the, um, uh, one of the movies, uh, they, I, I keep getting older. They stay the same age and, uh, it's harder. <laughs> it's, it gets, it, 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 it's harder for me to keep up with these boys. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to write it out as long as I can. Um, the moment that I feel like I'm a disservice to the game, that's when I'll retire. And, but, um, you know, ultimately that's what drove me to, to make it really, a, a, a way of life for me. Um, I think that this, this next year will, and I'm already registered for, the 22 23 season with the Minnesota State High School League. And um, I think this will mark my 29th year serving for the Minnesota State High School League. That's awesome. Um, and um, I'm also looking at uh, coming back and helping my son, who just turned 15, to uh, maybe take the reins over for the Perpich family and, and start roughing. And, and I can teach him and pass that knowledge on because, uh, you know, it, it does take a lot of time to progress to the way that coaches, especially at the higher levels, want the game officiated. Yeah. It, it's not black and white. It's not, it's not strictly by the rule book. It's knowing when to call the calls, when to let something go. And really it's, it's that game experience that it's going to well, get into that right there. That, that's a good point. So yeah. when, when to make the call, when to not make the, I mean, that, that's an interesting point. How do you, well, how long did it take you to get there? And, and. Well, I think, I think, you know, for, for the most part, we're always, you know, I, I, I sit down and evaluate all the good things after every game and all the bad things. I still make, you know, I still make calls that I wish I wouldn't have and calls that I should have, should have made that, uh, that I didn't. And, you know, you, you evaluate, it's, it's always a growing, growing process. I mean, we've all watched NHL games where, where we've seen those, the best of the best, like, what are you calling there? I mean, they're, yep. they're still, and, and the other thing too, is that, you know, at the high school league, everything happens so fast, especially, you know, at the double A, some of the Grand Rapids games that I've refed, uh, it, it happens so fast that I can't, you know, the human eye can't see it. It goes in and out and, you know, you have to use your best judgment. Did it go in? If I didn't, you know, my, I always have the ad- attitude that if I didn't physically see the puck go in, then I'm not going to call it. And I don't have to call the goal. If you don't I'm, see it cross yeah, the line. And, and, I'm, and I've always stuck to that rule and that, that rule has helped me out a lot. Now, as far as calling the game, you know, it, I really let the players determine how I'm going to call the game. Um, you know, and I, and I know the history of a lot of teams as they step on the ice, you know, whether or not there's, there's, uh, uh, you know, it's, if it's a rival game, you know, like the Grand Rapids Greenways, um, you know, the, the, Hibbing, or better yet, but it's not going to happen anymore. But the Virginia Eveleth games, where there's definitely a lot of, of that rivalry, um, y- you kind of have to know, the, you get to know the players, how they react. Um, but really, I, I just let it up to them. If they start doing stupid stuff, um, you do you do stupid uh, things and you get stupid rewards. And those rewards are, are penalties. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, I always let the, let the players kind of decide. And and you know, uh, typically, I don't like to call it as many penalties as a lot of people because I like to see the game being played out. You play full. Um, you play hard, and you know, hockey is a contact sport, um, which 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 brings you to which brings you to you know some of the some of the younger younger levels where you know um, you know obviously this this year in the last couple of years uh, they've taken checking out of pee wee hockey, and I don't know if I agree with that or not. But it's obviously, you know, I do agree with it in the fact of player safety, 
but uh, you know, coming into Bantams and not knowing how to check and knowing how to play that game, it creates a lot of difficulty. But but overall, you know, I you know, I, the way I like to call games is you, you drop the puck and uh, you make sure the first one is a, a is an obvious, definitive call. And what I'm looking for is you know, um, was there a change of possession? Was there a, a, a you know a deliberate fall from behind? Or was there intent to injure? Or you know, for, you know, obviously player safety is number one for me. And then you know, if not, if there's something that's you know, two kids are wrestling down in the corner has nothing to do with the play. Chances are I'm sure. going to let that go. You know, it's not not really uh, going to benefit anybody by sitting two kids out for two minutes when it's going to be uh, five on five, right? Yeah. So, well, I'll tell you what. We'll we'll uh, we'll dig into maybe some of those rule changes and this and that. And Puka is going to give us a little bit of a. Uh, uh, commercial break. Yeah, we got, yeah, we'll get in one in here. Um, ODR swag. Okay. You can see it right here. Iron Range Apparel, Thunderbird Mall in Virginia, exclusive supplier of the ODR line. The Richter's going to have it going on there, but beyond ODR swag, which you can find in t-shirts, baseball caps, winter caps, jerseys, etc. Of course, it stands for outdoor ring cocky. Um, but I've always said the gift buyer's paradise, all kinds of Minnesota themed items, shot glasses, keychains. They have the Ham's Bear with, on some t-shirts, which is one of their more popular items. So there's bottom line, a gift for anybody. It's the gift buyer's paradise. If you're looking for a gift for that special somebody, please check out Iron Ranger Apparel in the Thunder, Thunderbird Mall in Virginia. Awesome. So yeah, we, we got a good feel here, Perp, of, of you know why you got into it. And I think a lot of good reasons that you put forth. Um, you know, it also, I'm sure also helps with that competitive itch that you got from being a player back in the sure. day, it keeps you involved in the game. Uh, but I kind of want to dig a little bit into maybe some rule changes here that have taken place. You touched on one of them uh, when it comes to youth hockey, you know, you, you get into some of these situations where I've been involved in the HP programs and I've been involved in high school hockey programs and in junior programs. And there's so many different rules at different levels. Like you mentioned, the no checking in peewees uh, puts a big kink into things. Um, you, you get into USA hockey versus high school hockey where they have no tag up off sides or uh, Bantam hockey. Uh, just one year before you get into high school, a team is on the penalty kill and they can't ice the puck anymore for free. They get charged uh, an ice yeah. and it goes back to their zone. But then when you get to high school one year later, you play shorthanded, you can ice the puck. Uh, you know, give me a, th a couple of thoughts on some of these rule changes um, that you like, some of them that you don't like. Well, um, you know, I, I obviously with the with the checking in PVs, I think that's drastically changed the way the game is played, even at the even at the high school level. Yeah. Um, I I actually helped out, uh, you know, Hibbing Chisholm's team with a, with a coaching clinic. And you know one of the one of the things that we do is second year peewee at the end of the year is we you know we let these kids we try to teach them how to check it in in, in, a, in a week's practice and um, you know ironically is have the habits are formed already and um, for example you know we run gauntlets and you know, kids are happy to hit because they're at that age where you know they got a lot of uh, raw energy and they, and they want to you know they want to they do want to hit. <laughs> and, and, um, but, you know, so we run, run them through gauntlets and run them through, you know, how to check, you know, don't, obviously when the numbers are there, uh, you, you don't check uh, as much as you can prevent that. Um, but it, the, the, the way that the game is played, no checking in peewees, which I'm all about player safety. Um, I, I, I'm not a doctor, so I, I, you know, the reasons for no checking in hockey is they say USA hockey doctors say that it's a developmental age of the brain. I'm not going to disagree with them because I'm not a doctor. So if that's what they say, I'm, I'm all about that, but it definitely has changed the way the game is played. I see a lot less hitting. Well, I can't um, argue that perp. I can't argue I mean, the developmental part of the brain. Yep. The one thing is just as a physical educator and a person that likes to express common sense, uh, here's the other factors, the developmental brain part, but let's get into the Bantam age where now you're learning checking for the first time ever. And now the difference between 
somebody who hasn't quite hit puberty yet and the kid that has been in puberty for however long this kid is now experiencing checking for the first time when there's such a difference in size there's way more difference in size at the bantam level than there is at the peewee level and i think you know like you talked about the brain development you can't argue that that's important for that but i think the body development portion when kids are being introduced on how to protect their bodies uh, how to take a check how to give a check it's like we're a year or two years late in in showing some of that and kids get really really uncoordinated that first second year into bantams yeah, that's the argument yeah. i've heard yeah well the first year of bantams you know my son was a first year bantam and uh you know they they really didn't hit at all the first half of the year you know as they as they got hit they started to you know we, and we always would run you know checking drills and and, and that and so when um and that's what that's what i'm talking about the game difference yeah uh, you know before when we were in Bantams, you know, we had two years of, of hitting behind us. Those shy years of, of, you know, not going into the corner when you needed to because you were afraid. Those those were done with in Peewees. Correct. You stepped up in Bantams and you were ready to play the game that, you know, you see in high school. Um, now it's just it's just shifted two years. So you see a lot of, of, of you know, those because those, those formative years in Peewees, they're not used to checking. So they get up to Bantams. And now there is checking. Well, they struggle for that first, you know, usually the first, you know, three months of the season. And it usually takes one bell getting rung. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, I see a lot of penalties for roughing and stuff because they don't know how to execute a check properly and, and fairly. So that's correct. Know, or the hands come up. The hands come up. protection of yourself. Yeah, they, don't, they don't know. You know, exactly. you, got a guy, you got a guy running out to the point and he's trying to finish a check on a defenseman and that defenseman in air to try and protect his face puts his hands up and guess what comes up with him is yeah. stick. And now he hits somebody in the head and he's getting a penalty for protecting himself. And it just seems, I mean, you're making a lot of good points. Yeah. When you talk about yeah. That. And, and, you know, and that's the other thing too. The kids don't know. And when they, when a lot of kids, when they're told that they can hit, yeah, there's various personalities, you know, that develop. Like my, my son's pretty, pretty passive aggressive. I, I'm looking at him to become meaner and he's, he, he's getting there. That'll come through time. Mm -hmm. um, but there's kids that are really aggressive and they have no idea how to throw a hit. And what happens is they're usually the ones in the box because right. either, either they'll connect with the hit and feel good um, or they'll miss and feel like they failed which, you know, the, the whole purpose of checking isn't to kill the guy, it's, no, it's to knock him off the puck. It's possession of the puck. It's to get possession. Or they'll miss and they'll completely take themselves out of the play. And yeah. sometimes because of the coordination issue, right. they may miss and go head first into the boards. Right, right. So it's injury and factors it, it, too. It's that. injury factors. But, uh, you know, that's one of the rules that, that um, you know, I, I, I can't say that I disagree with. I understand where it's coming from. But, you know, I, I definitely think it's, it's changed the way that uh, refs are calling the game. I know that refs are are very, at least when, because I, you know, obviously coached last year. I know they're very strict about, you know, unnecessary checks. Um, yeah. um, you know, if it, if let's say I pass the puck and you know, like you talked about finishing, finishing checks. checks. Yeah. Um, we were always taught finish your check doesn't yep. matter. Yep. Uh, you know, if 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 the puck's off your stick and I and I'm coming at you, I better back up, otherwise I'm going to the box. And that's yep. Yep. And that's fair. Um, you know, some of the other things that I think that that um, I would I, 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 you know, I would like to see more of is, you know, the, the high school lining up with with USA hockey, which, you know, I would like to see, you know, because I there's been times when I've been working out of three, maybe even four rule books and uh, and each rule book has, you know, a definitive or a, or a different set of rules. So, you know, for example, uh, I think, you know, if you shoot the puck off the post and it goes over the net um, and I, and I, it's, I've been, a, been a while from USA hockey, but you know, that, that in a few years back, that was deemed um, a, a non-talented play, which means that the face off would come outside. Now they deem it a, a talented play, meaning that you're, that you're actually aiming for that spot. And the face-offs don't mold. Uh, it's just <laughs> aiming for the pipe, it, it's right? It's just, it's just, it's just very, very difficult. Yeah. And then you know, at the NCAA level, which which I have worked uh, for about twelve years, I, I, I retired in twenty fourteen. But um, you know, there you have you know the modified touch icing. You have to. Yeah. Make, there's a lot of things that you have. It is, it is complicated, um, but not when not when you get the hang of it. Um, the other thing that I 
that I really like with uh, the NCAA is, is when you ice the puck, uh, there's no line change. Right. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, it, you know, you ice the puck and it's, it's it, it, the way I view it is you're using the rule book to your advantage, which is smart as a coach. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, you know, NCAA, they've taken that away. Uh, you know, the guys are gassed. They can't just yep. ask the puck and get a line change. Well, you can't just panic anymore. And I no. guess that's the, that's the, the key going back to the olden days. So what, what Perp is talking about is when the, when the puck is iced, uh, it doesn't matter if it's 10 seconds into the shift, you're in the defensive zone, you can't gain possession of the puck, be able to break it out of your zone. And you decide, well, I'm you know, panic, panic. I'm just going to fire it down the ice, get a whistle so that we can get fresh legs out there. Well, it doesn't matter if it's 10 seconds or if you've been out there for two minutes, they've been pumping the forecheck on you. When you ice the puck, your line's not able to change if you iced it. Yep. And that it gets to be an issue uh, at lots of levels with teams that have four lines uh, and are well conditioned at the college level, at the professional level. Um, but this a topic of conversation, I've said this for years, is that there's a skill to being able to break the puck out. There's a skill to being smart and playing smart defensively uh, and be able to get possession of the puck. Uh, if, if you get teams that are maybe not real deep, they don't have, they're not three lines deep. Sure. Uh, it's tough. Guys get gassed. Lots of times somebody's going to ice the puck at the high school level and their first line was out there. Um, maybe the other team didn't have their first line out there uh, and you're on the road. It's like, you, you're not going to be able to match that line. Ice the puck, your first line's gas. Sometimes coach is taking a time out because he needs to get his first line out there. Same time their first line is out there. So it's, yep, yep. it's a difficult process to think about, but uh, I'm kind of with you that I think if, if you really want to get into the X's and O's of how the game is played and how to play the game smart and to work on skill and puck possession. That'd be another one. Don't, don't let teams just fire the puck out of the zone when it's five on five. Yeah. And when you're talking about injury prevention, I mean, talk about putting kids at risk for injury, just tired and tired and yeah. tired. You know I mean? You're keeping yep. them out there. I, um, yeah. That, that was always kind of a goofy, goofy rule. Well, I, I'm going to set you guys up for something. Let me, let me run a, a uh, or Reed, why don't you run a quick ad for Minnesota Hockey Camps? Yeah, Minnesota Hockey Camps, uh, MHC over in Breezy Point, Minnesota, under new ownership. Now this is year two under new ownership with uh, with Chris Stewart, Craig Larson, and Tony Massieri. They've been running. This is week two going on right now uh, at Minnesota Hockey Camps. They're on the ice a couple of times a day. They got some dry land going. Uh, they're still looking for some people to sign up here over the course of week three and week four, uh, but check out their webpage, check them out on Instagram, uh, check them out on Twitter and Facebook. They had uh, a couple of videos and some, some great stuff popping out here this, this last week of how week one went um, and check it out to see how week two is going right now. Minnesota hockey camps. All right. Appreciate it. So good stuff here, everybody. Uh, if you could subscribe, hit, hit the like button. We'd appreciate that. Hammer that thing right now. All right. So Herb, high school ref, Reed, High school hockey coach in the pre-chat here. I guess there was an incident. Uh, who wants to start? I want to hear about the uh, the little incident here and uh, have some fun with this. Well, let Perp talk. He, well, he'll he's go up there. He's the man of the hour. He's with a special guy. Yeah. I was a high school coach. <laughs> I still am. But I know that I've had my moments with referees in the area where I get boisterous. And and I know that our referees have, we have got mutual respect. But I want to hear what Perp has to say. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, actually, Reed, you know, going back to the days of, of Virginia, I really had uh, very little issues with, you know, the, 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 the former uh, Virginia coach, um, Keith, Keith Hendrickson, he was the he was the guy that was hard to really work for because every <laughs> every call, whether it was right or wrong, it was a yell from from Keith. And you know, one I'm just going to go back to Keith really quickly, but to one of the incidents that I had a, a the the puck uh, the net came off, the puck went in after the net came off. At least that's what I saw. Um, I then wasn't sure, so I asked my partner. He said. I, I wasn't down on the line. I couldn't see it, so I called the goal judge. Now this is at uh, at in Virginia, at the old miners, and the goal judge, you know, walked all the way around to the scorers table, and um, I just asked him, you know, did the net come off before the puck went in? And he said, yes, absolutely. I said, I looked at Keith and I said, no goal, and uh, Louis Gasket. Oh, he went. <laughs> you just went from the top of my list to the bottom and, uh, and do we need the bleep button <laughs> yeah. 
and he yelled it so everyone in the in the crowd heard it and and i you know after the period i, I when he's that heated i don't i don't really like to uh, yeah not, not much i can really add to to his opinion um but i talked to him afterwards and i said keith you know i'm i'm just looking to make the right call yeah and you know after the end of the game he he, he had some some re, some mutual respect and said i know Absolutely. i know, I well, know. You, you but you get heated these... you, you know you get heated in the game and but but uh, what Roger's talking to about is you know I always try to have a little fun and you know let coaches know that it's it's hockey it's a game um, although it's very very important to a lot of people at the end of the day you know we have, what how many how many uh, D one guys do we have out of the Iron Range yeah. in the last in the last five years maybe maybe five handful. six ten a handful yeah um, not many so, so 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 and we're talking from you know 170 in 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 Hibbing. You know, another 100 in Greenway, another probably 200 in Rapids, and you know, 150 in Virginia, and 100. I mean, there's there's a thousand kids that that want all the same thing. But um, so I always try to keep it light. You know, I know I know that coaches get into the games, and you know, one of the one of the things you know we do have a strong union mentality up here. Yes, um, we do. And so one of the things that I always like to to calm down the coaches when, especially when they're heated, yep. is 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 say you know you know you know he comes and asks me he's like did you see that and i said you see what and uh he goes you know that 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 hold over there and i said yeah i did and i and uh, he goes well are you gonna call it i said i can't call that and why can't you call that <laughs> well i mean that's that's an 87 dollar call and i only make 85 dollars <laughs> so so you know and usually yeah that sets some right down yeah, the yeah. tone right down that the tone. Them down. That's... and they're you know, at first they're like, what the hell, what the heck did he just say to me? Yeah. And I'm just like, well, um, you know, I'm just, just kind of putting light on the subject and, you know, making everyone easier. They usually have a laugh and calm down. Um, that's so, funny. so, I mean, that's some of the camaraderie we have with coaches, but you know what, just like anything, they see you for the first time and they're going to press your buttons. Oh, for they're, sure. They're going to press your buttons. They're going to know if you are a skilled referee immediately. And if you're, if you, you know, I mean, you, you got to have a little bit of that hockey player mentality when you're refing. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to have a little bit. Well, you're of, there to compete. A little bit of boys. A little bit of cockiness, you know, because you have to be 100 percent sure when you're making that split second decision. Yeah, this guy's, you know, put your arm up. This guy's going for two. Yeah, and, and you got to be in control of the game, yeah. and that's kind of the key to it. I think yeah. uh, I think there's two things that come out of that. You know, just in that brief thing that you were talking about with Keith and our experience that we've had too. There's there's two things from uh, from a coaching standpoint too is. Lots of times the, the information that you're getting, whether that had been from me or from Keith, from any other coach, a lot of times what you're getting is uh, number one, they're, they're getting communication between, you know, the two adults that are down at ringside, right? Mm -hmm. And the rest are kids that are out there playing and being competitive. And uh, from a coaching standpoint, there, there honestly were times where I knew that the call didn't need to be made. Um, but I'm barking at the referee to come over and talk to me about it so that the guys that are standing on my bench know that sure. I'm behind them. Right. Um, and there are many times where I've called a referee over and I've just said, could you come over here and talk to me? And the referee, if they come over there, uh, as long as they come over and they just, they're willing to be open ears, I'll bend over and just whisper in their ear. Can you just give me 30 seconds right now? Uh, I know you're not going to make a call, but everybody in the building right now knows and thinks that I'm fighting for my kids. And so do the 15 kids standing on the bench and the five out on the ice know that I'm fighting for you. Uh, and after we've wasted about 10 seconds, just nod your head. I'll nod my head, pat you on the back and you go back out on the ice. And I think <laughs> honest to God, there's wow, that strategy. nine oh, times out of 10. That's, that's what it is, is just, I just want, Want an explanation for my kids right, right. rather than an explanation to me because I know that it's difficult and going back to uh, you know one of the reasons why you refereed one of the reasons why you refereed is because you can uh, one of the reasons why I didn't referee is because there's no way that I could go out on the ice and take control of everybody in the building as well as all the players on the rink and all the coaches in the building and every spectator that thinks they know the game better than you do and it takes a personal uh, it takes a special personality to be able to ref a game and be in control of the whole building. And it takes somebody that's got a lot of confidence to be able to walk out of the building at the end of the night because half the people love you and the other half hate you. Right. And, and that's not the always, line. not always. And maybe you're the hero because you're at home and you're at the Memorial Building in Virginia or in, in Hibbing and they just won and there's 3,000 people in the building and 2,000 are from 
Hibbing and the other thousand are for some someplace else and you're a hero. Uh, that could be the case, but the biggest hero, I think, in that, like I said, in that situation with the referees is the guy that's got, you know, the ability to be able to go out there and be confident, even though uh, they make mistakes just like the kids do, just like the coaches do. And I think uh, just kind of going back to what you said about Keith is the one thing that was good about Keith, you knew Keith was going to be in your ear. You knew he was going to be hard on you. Uh, yep. But at the end of the day, he respected what you were doing for his kids out there. And you respected him because he was going to fight for his kids too, regardless of you're going to bump heads. And at the end of the day, you're going to shake hands and walk out of the building together. Right, right. Absolutely. So Herp has had some time down at the state hockey tournament. So you alluded to the girls game, longest game in Minnesota State High School Hockey League state tournament history. Uh, correct. Okay. Tell us about that one. What do you remember about that one? And how long was it? Uh, how tired were you? Well, the Gatorades? it was okay. So this game happened in, I believe it was February of 2013. Um, the teams were Lakeville, uh, I believe it was Lakeville North and Minnetonka. And it was the later, the, the evening session on Friday, which are, are the fun games to definitely get. It was, it was live on TV. Um, and uh, we stepped on the ice, my partner, Chad Schakowsky, um, and then we had Drew Walters and uh, another guy that I can't remember from Duluth um, that worked the game. And uh, as a referee, you know, you, you, you expect those, those semifinals to be really, really intense. great, intense games. Um, you just don't expect them to go um, as long as that one did. And, and the way the high school league works is you, you run, you know, you period, you, a 17 minute period, you resurface, a 17 minute period to resurface. Well, this game in particular um, had those first three 17 minute periods. And then after that, they had six more periods. Um, uh, six more periods after that? Nine periods? There were six overtime periods. Um, so it, would, it was nine nine periods in all, uh, but that's not nine, seven minutes. It was eight no, minutes. Eight minutes. Seven, 17 No, minutes. they go eight minutes resurface. 17, 17 minutes, minutes, eight, 17, yep. eight. The, the game ended up. Um, Were you the late game, I hope? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. didn't push someone off. So, so we stepped on the ice at about 8, 8.15, maybe a little bit after 8, 15, 8.30. <laughs> and um, the, by the time the game was done, it was uh, a, a little bit after one o'clock in the morning. Wow. Um, and so, won? and it was Minnetonka. And, you know, ironically, uh, this, this comes down to a, 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 the actual call on the ice. Where I had to make, uh, I was the I was the down guy making the making the call, and um, Minnetonka's player was getting checked or getting pushed, you know, pushed off to the side. And if I remember right, that the Minnetonka forward uh, passed it out in front, and it and it deflected, you know, right off the shoulder, and when um, went in the net. And now keep in mind, this is six overtimes. Um, I'm exhausted. Everyone's fatigued. And if I call this, you know, in my mind, if like, I, if I call this no goal because it was deflected off the body, which actually wasn't the right call, but um, it, you can legally deflect a puck um, as long as you don't bat it with your hand or kick, uh, it, or, or kick it with your foot. It's the deflection. So um, I had to make that split second decision. And the rationale is that we have we have people upstairs uh, at the state tournament, as you know, yep. um, that will definitively call it a goal. And I decided to go down and, and make the call for the goal. And um, um, it was a it was a legit goal. And, and they couldn't they, overturn it from upstairs. They, they, could, they couldn't overturn it. And uh, and I was very, very pleased with that game. But, you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, people that think that the Duluth East Apple Valley I was game. at that game. I watched. I was it. at it. I was at it as well. Up in the nosebleed. Yep. And that. Great job in the '96 game or '96. '96. Okay. Yeah, I was watching. And that, that was. And that was. You know, that's. I think that was the longest boys, and this beat it by like, you know, I want to say eight minutes or something like that. Well, this is so, now in the time of the St. Paul Civic Center where right. they didn't have replay and they didn't have that television and be able to go upstairs right. and to go back. I was sitting behind Apple Valley's net up in the nosebleed. And Eric Potosha actually scored. Yeah, his puck went in over the shoulder and under the crossbar right. and right. went back yeah. out. 
and nobody saw it go in except for a bunch of people that were sitting up and we're cheering for Duluth East. Apple Valley just keeps playing the game on the game just keeps going. Duluth East should have finished that in the second overtime. Yep. Uh, but because there's no replay, because there wasn't a, I mean, at a stoppage of play nowadays, uh, you know, wow. Coach Randolph could have said, could we go back and check well, the fact, replay on? In fact, they, the way that the high school league is set up now is that they would automatically go back. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and that's the whole purpose of having yep. an instant replay. Well, is like I said, you know, as a referee, I can't see the, the plays happen so fast in and out, you know, especially if it hits that back post and out. Yep. And that's exactly what it think came what out so fast. And, and, you know, I was standing on the opposite end of the rink and I'm the only one that stood up <laughs> because I was going <laughs> yep. for section seven. Yep. And I stood up and no one else stood up and yep. the game kept on going. And I'm we like, were right behind it. There's oh, a yeah. whole row of Grand Rapids guys sitting up top because we've gotten beaten by Duluth East and the, you know, the semifinals or whatever it was, or I can't even remember what we got, who got, who we got beat by that year, but we got beat and we were chair for section seven. Yep. Same thing happened, but, but, so, and, and that's a case where the referees didn't get it right. I mean, yeah, but, wow. but not their own fault. Right. Right. You they know, couldn't see it. They, they couldn't see it. it. Right. Right. Well, they couldn't see it, but except for a select few people in the nosebleed <laughs> section, they could see it from yeah, out there. The and, net moved. And, and, and that's the way the game is. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, I, what I ask for parents and fans, um, especially at, at the USA hockey levels, at the uh, high school hockey levels, is that we we're, we're humans. Okay, we we do make mistakes. Um, I don't that rarely. I'm, I'm pretty, <laughs> yeah, I'm, you're on it. One mistake every other. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. very rare. You're allowed very, one this year very, as long as very, it's not very against rare. Happens very rarely. Um, uh, but you know, there's times when you have to make calls. I think one of my biggest calls this year, uh, I had the Rapids uh, uh, Hermantown game and. Um, you know, they, they, uh, so at the end of the game, ironically, after they just tied, it, when, when, they tied it up. We were up they, three to two. Uh, they tied yeah. it up. They tied it up. And, and, and it was a it, shot. And then I think Ricochet. Pert, did Pert get called from behind? Uh, well, that, this was in this call, last year or the year before? Last year, Herman This last season, if Pert, Pert was gone, no, oh. no, it would have been, uh, Pert was off to St. Claude. Would have been East and young, East and young, or Red well, I don't remember, but I know that his feet were taken out, and he had a scoring opportunity. Oh. So, so I, uh, I uh, immediately went over to my partners just to confirm, and I called a penalty shot. Yep, and gave the, the Grand Rapids an opportunity. To yes, have a free. Oh, oh, it was Gear Trots. Trots. It was Gear Trots. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yep. so I gave. I, I don't like. I said I don't keep track of. Well, that was the second penalty shot that we had gotten in a matter of two weeks. Yep. We had the same thing happen to us. Uh, against us at home was it the week before that yeah. Andover was in the building and Bazelki, uh with literally one second left in the game made a call for a penalty shot uh, puck was scrambled they had their goalie pulled they were Andover was down uh, three to two to us and they're pumping in with shots on our goalie Miles Gunderson making saves and um, one of our defensemen falls on the puck in the crease well you cover the puck in the crease for the goalie. It's a penalty shot. Yep. So they had their top player, Gavin Thorson, was out there on a breakaway. He had uh, the penalty shot, and lo and behold, Miles Gunnarsson stopped him in front of 3,000 people. So it was and, pretty and cool. Not to mention all the people watching on, and, on television. Yeah, and there were watch, a lot watching on television. I got another question to ask you about state tournament stuff. Sure. Puka, have you got another commercial? To throw uh, well, we'll, just, well, we'll just throw one real quick again. We're at the Ring Sports Bar and Grill. I want to thank them for hosting us. It's been great. Uh, second time they posted us, uh, you know, full menu, full bar. You can order online at the ringsportsbarandgrill.com to order by phone 248-8582. So like I said, when you're in the area, when just, I mean, the Hockey Hall of Fame is right up the road. The reason we're talking about it's down the road. We're talking about golf putting, brief, but it's like right up the road. And now it's uphill. It's, it's, now it's uphill. So it's taking a driver. But um, so the United States Hockey Hall of Fame, like I said, right here in Neville. But um, when you're in the area, the Ring Sports Bar and Grill, check them out. Come down here and say hi to Michelle. She'll take good care of you. Awesome. So one other question about the state tournament. This is the topic of conversation because I've been down to watch a state high school hockey tournament a number of times uh, for the boys tournament over the course of the last 20 years. And one of the, I suppose, recent changes in the last maybe 10 years has been the addition of a fourth official out on the ice. Uh, it doesn't happen in every single game during the season. Sometimes it happens in the section finals at certain places. Uh, but one of the things I noticed is watching it as a, as a coach and you know, you're always critical of, of how much space you have and don't have. And I, I can't remember the year that I watched it on the state tournament, but I swear 
every time the puck came in from the wall, it hit a referee on the line as it was coming in. Do you agree with four referees on the rink at the state tournament, or does it get to a point where there's just too many guys out there and it takes up too much space? Um, well, actually, you know, as far as, as the importance of, of what it means to those kids, um, having four officials out there just makes it a lot easier on the referees to focus on the penalty calls that they yes. have to make and calling the game. Um, Cause you know, when you're, when you're working the two one line, when you're working the two referee one lines and system, the, the, the middle referee ends up being a linesman in some way, yep. shape or form, you know, with the two, two system, um, referees just worry about making calls and the linesmen are the ones that worry about the offsides and the icings. So when that's completely off of your plate, um, makes life easier. It, it makes life a lot easier yeah. to make that call. In addition, the way that the positioning of it works, where you know um, you, you have one guy down deep and one guy up high, you know it, it, it you can get out of the way a lot easier as far sure. as a referee. You can see things from different angles. It feels way better to you know sometimes when 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 the play is coming at you, you know you have that's another thing. Is, you know, with this two-two system, you really have to know how to skate backwards. Yep. Because you want to see the play coming at you, and that's where you know that's where your your athletic ability as an official really helps because you want to number one pick up on on how fast they're coming at you, so you, they don't get behind you. But you can see the play envelop right in front of your face, and you can see you know is he holding him? He look for that glove. Is he touching the glove? Is it is it going to be a hold? You know, you can just see it from a lot different different angles. So I definitely, and, and it gives a, officials a, uh, a, a, you know, more officials a, a chance to work in those yeah. big games. And, and so I'm all for it. Um, well, you hear it, from an official there and it's important to understand that, you know, it's, 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 it's good to know what's going to make their lives a lot easier. It's going to make calls easier. It's going to make positioning a lot easier. Um, I guess coming from a coaching standpoint, uh, I don't have a problem with any of those comments. The only issue I have is if we're going to do it in the state tournament, we should do it all year long. And I think that comes down to a, bu a budget issue, right? Well, I think it's not only not only a budget issue, but I think it's just referee availability. That too. I mean, I mean, let's let's Again, let's, let's be honest. Let's let's yep. be honest. I mean, yep. USA Hockey this year, um, District Twelve, which is on the Iron Range, um, you know, because we've been hurting for officials, and and it's not that we're hurting for officials, but we want to get people in there that actually care about making yes. the right calls. You can put a body in there. Um, you know, Tommy Pogorelsk could go in there and he could rough a, a fine game. <laughs> yeah. You know? But but the question is, is do, do, do they have the hockey knowledge? Yeah, right. you can go and pass a test, but do you really know the game? And are you looking to, you know, you have to have that personality of, I'm just, I just want to continually get better every game. I yeah. want to learn. And so, you know, we, we because USA Hockey has so little referees and so many kids are starting to play, um, we're, you know, our numbers are starting to pick up all across the range that we don't have enough. In fact, we've had games, um, our Banner B team last year had a tournament in Duluth that they had to cancel us on, on a Wednesday night. We were no supposed, to, supposed to leave on Thursday because of, of COVID and the fact that they didn't have have any uh, referee availability. So, um, well, you, hear you, you know, yeah, obviously in an ideal world, yeah, it, would, it, it comes down to budget, number one. Yeah. Uh, but number two, it comes down to, I mean, there's nights for, for our association, our I range Ho hockey association, um, that every guy is working. And yeah. uh, if one guy happens to not be there, um, you throws know, a, throws we, a cake we might have to go with a two official system. So, so, but what, what, the, you know, the high school league, um, and, and the local ADs here have all, you know, realized that, you know, we're trying to incentivize people to stay in the game, stay in, um, you know, USA Hockey has been searching for people. This year in District 12, uh, the fees go up by $10 per game per official. Yeah. So previously, when you worked a little white mic game, it was $25. This year, it's going to be $35. Well, for for Pee Wee games, it was $45. It's going to be $55. For Bantams, it was $55. It's going to be $65. And the, the the hope is is that we get more more people. Um, you know, like I said when I came on interested in that buck, but then eventually transition into something that you want to make it a part of your life and, and you right. get back. So well, I'm going to give Roger the last question here, but I'm just going to close myself with this right here before we move on here is, 
uh, you know, obviously you hear passion from the referees. And I think that, you know, you made the comment here earlier that not only is it a budget issue, but it's a numbers issue. And that's the whole purpose of us making sure that we can bring a, a good referee guy on to, uh, tea with Miss McGill is we want to support the referees, the coaches, the players, the parents, the fans. We want to make sure we do that. We did uh, a nice little interview last year uh, on our My Nine Network and talked to to a referee there. Um, Troy Scott. He, Troy Scott was there on there. We talked to Troy and and had an opportunity to to continue. Uh, to make sure that we promote things. We need referees out there. We need people that are passionate and your passion is respected by the coaching uh, world out there as well as the players. Roger. Yeah, actually I'm saving my question for the next time. We got to run. We're pulling a hard clock here, but um, uh, that's it for Reed. We appreciate you approve. Come guys. If you have any, uh, any in inclination, if your kids want to start refereeing, just go out to USA hockey, um, dot com and look up officials information. And there's a way to get get uh, get in contact with Minnesota Hockey. I think Minnesota Hockey also has a has a website. But we are looking for officials. So you know, if you guys uh, do have the urge, it's a great way to make money. I, I tell people, where else can you make 50 bucks for an hour and a half, hour 45 minutes of work, and get a workout, that's and right. get to watch the best game that's that's that we have yeah. available to us. No demand. All right, we're gonna sign off then. So please comment, like, subscribe. As always, if you want to contact us more privately, Goats Force Media, LLC at gmail.com. Um, if you dig the show, like to share it out to your friends. Uh, Reed's got the merch on, 20 bucks for any, any shirt up to double X. It's 22 for anything over. It's got all the reader. I can do, we're going through a bunch of swag this summer. Um, so thanks to all of our sponsors, Blue Line Brews, Rick Sparse Bar and Grill. Thanks for hosting, hosting us again, Iron Ranger Apparel and ODR Swag. Minnesota Hockey Camps, Iron Reach Goalie Academy. Uh, you can find us on Rumble at Gold Sports. You can find us on Instagram at T with Miss McGill. Have a safe Labor Day weekend, everybody. For Reed Larson, I am Puka. Get out there and be your dream. You're tuned to the T with Miss McGill show.